It wasn't like we knew the ropes going into Riven. The world was just so different. And we were kind of like trying, we were stumbling around trying to find a style for this thing. Most of our stumbling around was still a little bit too much in the direction of mist. It still had a kind of that romantic architecture. We were determined to do something better than what mist was. We just wanted something that was more dynamic, more alive. Riven became much larger than what we could have imagined. We all got together right after Miss. We all got together in Chris Brandcamp's garage, and that became our office. It's a nice garage. Yeah, I think we had 12 people upstairs in this garage, just crammed into these little yeah. work areas. We moved into the strip mall from the garage, and that was that was like heaven. Here we had a real office. And we had brought on a number of people onto the Riven team, and then nobody else could come on because we were out of space. At that point in time, though, we started building the office. Here we were able to, to build a real building the same time we're building these virtual buildings. So after a year in the strip mall, we were able to graduate into this to basically do the hard stuff for Riven. The very first thing we did with Riven was design the whole gameplay for the, for the entire world, which is basically just a blueprint of all of the puzzles that the player will find throughout the environment. We take that blueprint and from there we begin to design maps of the places and some of the puzzles and how things would work. And is the whole thing like a solid canopy from the top of the tops of these trees just create a big as dark as possible. Okay. Yeah, and that's gonna be a difficult part right. because we want it to be dark. We want it right. to be when you look up, you just see kind of little bits and pieces right. of the sky. Are these things like redwood in size? Yeah, I vertically think as well as redwood and so not vertically though. I think they're going to be a lot more squat. Oh, okay. Oh. Vertically. Okay. Richard Vanderwin is a, is uh, somebody we met under these weird circumstances. Rob and I were down demonstrating uh, mist at some show. I don't even remember exactly which one it was. And um, this tall, skinny guy walked up to uh, Rob and he came up in a baseball cap and a big baggy pair of shorts, and I thought he was some kid. <laughs> um, we found out he had worked for Disney and ILM and um, had been the, uh, um, had it played a large role in the look and feel of Aladdin. Uh, the designs he had, design sketches he had, he had done were just phenomenal. I couldn't believe it. They were just on target. It was incredible. It had a level of depth that was the stuff that interested us. He ended up, I think, um, giving Riven something that we could have never given it. It was just another voice and a very strong, uh, mature voice with a lot of talent that was saying, hey, why don't we try doing it in this direction a little bit? Why don't we just kind of push it? What we're proposing is that you link to this age and what you see when you get there is right in front of you is this uh, gate and there's this big sort of lake with canyon walls all the way around. It's at nighttime with the moonlight. The oh. moon is out. Okay. And in the center of this body of water, there's a little rocky island mm -hmm. and a big sort of dead looking tree, perhaps. On top of which they have built this, constructed this gigantic um, adobe mound, sort of like a wasp's nest looking thing. After he came, he imbued the whole project with a a flavor that was a bit more edgy and strange and odd. It wouldn't have been as cool uh, if he hadn't been around. Riven became a place to us as we were designing it. Richard and Robin were picturing themselves there. It was, it was part of what we were doing. Our attempt was to make um, elements in the Riven world look 
old and used and uh, broken in. Because you see a lot of computer-generated art that looks plasticky or new or somehow strange. It doesn't look real. We're used to weathered things. That, that implies reality. The trip to Santa Fe came out of our need for textures. It's as simple as that. So we got pictures of wood and doors and sand and stucco. We wanted to take a lot of pictures of, you know, a lot of nice adobes and woods down there. Um, very old, kind of uh, weathered wood doors and things like that. So we could map them onto our geometry. You know, the, the huts, the village huts, that's, those are all Santa Fe textures. Even the village doors, all from Santa Fe. It's just extremely important for us when we're creating anything never to do it just for the sake of doing it, just because it's cool, man. You know, we, we try to really put meaning into every aspect of the world that we're building. The work in the game is, is one of the things that's subtly behind the scenes telling the story. In our backstory of this age, the indigenous people here looked at the work as the most powerful thing they knew. Like Eskimos and the whale, I mean, it was just kind of a great respect for that animal. There's a gallows area that we call the Warwick Gallows um, in, the, in the big village area on the, on the jungle island. Um, it's the trapeze handle that you can go up and down on if you figure out how. That's actually a Warwick Gallows where a person would be tied to that uh, handle and Gan from his throne area would open and close the, uh, the iris to determine whether that person would live or die. There's a wark that would be underneath that area in a cage in the water, and uh, Gen's handle would open or close it as the person was lowered. And if Gen was feeling particularly wonderful on that day, he would spare the person's life, and if not, the wark would get a tasty meal. When you finally see the animal, you may or may not understand how it relates to everything else in the game, but you know that this is a part of their culture. And, uh, and that makes, it makes the world a realer place and it makes the characters more real. How's it going so far? Today, when we get done, be done with yesterday's schedule. <laughs> Does that tell you anything? <laughs> no one here had any experience with dealing with actors or casting or costumes or blue screen. The live action was something that, that was new for us, for Riven. I don't think we realized how tough it would be. One of the big challenges we were looking forward to was merging a CG object with uh, a live action person. In fact, in one of the scenes, we actually have a scribe run through, jump in a, a maglev, throw the switch, and turn the thing around while you're watching him. The hoops you have to jump through when you're doing that to make that come alive is, is incredible. Okay, we still have speed, we're still rolling. Ready? One, two, three, go. The rotation thing seemed like that was going to be easy. We didn't actually know exactly how we were going to rotate the guy on the set. We had to build this huge contraption that rotated at just the same radius that the maglev would rotate, and the lights had to match so that the lighting on the scribe had to match what you would expect. Action, go. Thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, thousand four, thousand five. Cut. It ended up being, from our point of view, a very spectacular effect. Hopefully, from the player's point of view, it just looked real. That was what we were shooting for. And the gate room started out with nothing in it. It was just a very cool puzzle. Richard and I sat together, and we came up with the ideas to make this room kind of a place of Gens that would represent so much about him. So, okay, great, we had this real pretty, you know, real nice, uh, all these nice ideas, and um, 
we built it and we made it so it would rotate, but we were not we were not thinking about the trouble that it would cause when we'd have to when we'd have to render all the different states. There's this one shot. You're standing in the middle of the gate room. You're looking out the door toward a fire marble dome in the distance. There's two doors separating you right in front of that fire marble dome. The inner door that's towards you could be down, or the outer door could be down. So there's two states right there. The fire marble dome could also, instead of spinning, it could be opened into the gold position. So there's two more states. This is all just from one camera angle. The room could be rotated into five different directions from that one camera angle as well. Uh, it was a nightmare. It was just a nightmare. Because we, we kept thinking we had all the states done. We kept thinking everything was done for the gate room. We'd send all this stuff upstairs and, um, you know, they would put it together and it's like, well, no, we're missing these 28 shots or, you know, just endless amounts. It turned into uh, hell. <laughs> One strange thing about making a world like this is that there's no sound to it until you're done. We had made these animations um, basically with a deaf ear. We, we didn't know what these animations were going to sound like. We had ideas for what they were going to sound like. But when the sound is put into them, it, um, it really makes them real. I mean, it, it, it makes them come alive for us. The basic thing that we're doing with these, well, with Riven, um, is presenting a place, building a place that we would want to go to. It makes you take a step back from the world and think about the place you're in. The best feeling of all comes at the very end when you finally get to see how all those things that you designed, all the complexity that you put into this environment and just hoped it would work, it comes together and it works.